A clavicle fracture is a fracture of the middle, lateral, or medial third of the clavicle. Fractures of the middle third of the clavicle, known as mid-shaft fractures, are the most common type, as the middle portion of the clavicle has less structural support. Before going into more detail about clavicle fractures, we need to first cover some basic anatomy. Here is the sternum, clavicle, scapula, the chromion and coronoid process of the scapula, and the humerus. There are also multiple ligaments that hold these bones together. These are the sternoclavicular ligament, the chromioclavicular ligament, the coracoclavicular ligament, and the coracochromial ligament. Clavicle fractures can occur in healthy bone or diseased bone. In healthy bone, they occur due to non-accidental injuries as a result of abuse. They may be also accidental as a result of a sport or non-sport related injury. The Almond classification is used to classify these fractures. And there are three groups. Group one are fractures involved in the middle third of the clavicle. Group two, fractures involved in the lateral third of the clavicle. And group three, fractures involving the medial third of the clavicle. Group one fractures of the mid shaft are the most common type as there is less soft tissue support here. The lateral and medial aspects of the clavicle have muscular and ligamentous structures that offer support. Now we'll look through two quick examples. This is a group one mid shaft fracture. Remember, they are the most common type. They involve the middle third of the clavicle, which has the least structural support. Now to a more complex injury, floating shoulder, which is seen in the illustration. So what is floating shoulder? It is the combined clavicle fracture and scapular fracture of the glenoid neck. It is a rare high energy injury which may occur from an MVA, fall from a height or gunshot. Key characteristics is the disruption of the superior shoulder suspensory complex, which includes the middle and distal clavicle, the chromion, the coracoid, the chromioclavicular ligament, the coracoclavicular ligament, and the glenoid. One must assess for other associated injuries, which may include pneumothorax, neurovascular injuries, and muscular injury. We have reviewed two specific examples here. How would you generally approach a patient? As with all trauma patients, one must apply basic ATLS principles. The idea is to first quickly look and identify and then stabilize life-threatening injuries. On examination, you'll use the look, feel, and move approach. Look for deformity, skin tinting, open wounds, or bruising. Feel for tenderness, crepitus, and perform a neurovascular check. On movement, you will note reduced range of motion. Make sure to look for other injuries to the shoulder, spine, or elbow, and perform a proper respiratory examination to exclude a pneumothorax. All patients should have a chest x-ray, as well as an AP shoulder x-ray with a Zanka view. A CT scan may be required for more complex injuries. Management. After ATLS principles have been applied and the fractures confirmed on imaging, if there is a pneumothorax or hemothorax, they will require an ICD and surgery. If there is no hemothorax or pneumothorax, and there is no other indications for surgery, such as an open fracture, skin tenting, poor alignment, a complex fracture, no cortical contact, the presence of other injuries to the chest or neurovascular structures, non-union post-conservative management, they will be treated non-operatively. Non-operative treatment includes a shoulder immobilizer, which is preferred, or a collar and cuff for three to four weeks to allow pain to settle and commence early range of motion. Those with indications for surgery will get an RF with a plate or intramedallion nail, as shown here and here. For more information and a one-page summary and quizzes on clavicle fractures, visit foremanandmedicine.com.